Uh, I actually like, and then there was, uh, can we talk about drawing on untapped resources and sources of resilience? And then an increased sense of interdependence. Can you cover those two? Yeah. Um, so, you know, both of those, I, I guess the first thing I would say is that um, everyone that I know who's engaged in political struggle, we're all trying to figure out how to be in community in the context of late stage capitalism. We're all alienated from our context. And one of the things that. Sorry, actually, really quick. Uh -huh. I'm really sorry. Yeah. This is another one, and I'm guilty of this all the time. And so it's wrong that I'm putting you on the spot, but I'm doing it anyways. What does late stage capitalism mean to you? This is another one of these terms that we throw around a lot. What does it mean to you? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's that the limitations of a uh, system of endless expansion uh, are bouncing up with, with the ecological boundaries of, of the life systems that support um, support life on this planet. Yeah. And so uh, we are at those limits right now. We are alive at that stage. Uh, and so there's a lot of implications of what that means. And I, you know, um, for me, what it means is, uh, how do we re-relate to, um, land, to each other, to, uh, the social commons when the commons have been fully eaten up and colonized by capital. We are at a place where the very land we stand on is privatized and owned. They're trying to privatize the air and the water. Um, and so the very basis upon which human beings have built community for time immemorial is now owned and privatized. And that's a specific stage of human history. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's occurring uh, at the exact moment that the entire um, balance of our ecosystem is going out of whack and in doing so um, is pressuring uh, our economic systems, our political systems, our social systems, and all the limitations of the individualistic alienation of, of capitalism are coming to a head, which is why our society is so depressed, which is why, you know, all the things you talk about on the show all the time. And so um, that's my answer to that question. Okay, I'm sorry. So I'll get you back <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. to, okay, draw on untapped resources and sources of resilience mm -hmm. and increase the sense of interdependence. Mm hmm Yeah. The, you know, one of the things that um, indigenous movements and black movements in particular in this country are leading with is in the way that they talk about their relationship to ancestors, uh, they are locating themselves within a larger trajectory of history that helps us ground this historical moment. Um, I was just today, I, so I was facilitating a workshop today for an environmental organization, and on my way there, I was listening to the post game from your show last week, and you played that Cornell West clip. Mm -hmm. And Cornell West was making the point that, on one hand, um, this this moment of neo-fascism is specific, uh, and it 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 is uh, intense and it is overwhelming, and also white supremacy has been a through line through U.S. culture since it since the U.S. was founded as right. well, right. and. Um, holding both, holding both, um, is an important, it, it's important to locate yourself so that you don't get so overwhelmed that you think the challenges ahead of us are insurmountable. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that indigenous movements teach us, for example, is that when people freak out about the climate crisis, you know, um, I think about apocalypse constantly and apocalypse, the Greek, you know, I, I don't like the etymology of doing the whatever word thing, but it does mean lifting the veil and it does mean unmasking what's really there. And different movements have emerged through different apocalypses through human history. And uh, there are movements that are grounded in having overcome apocalypse in the past. The genocide of, you know, 95% of native people on this continent was an apocalypse. And there are people who lived through it who have insights about what that means. And when we're in a moment of civilizational transition and collapse, where for there's an expanding circle of apocalypse, yeah. where uh, the transition that we're in is more and more undeniable for more and more people. It reaches higher, higher into the circles of privilege and that there's a way we can locate ourselves within that. And that what what native movements are telling the rest of us is learning how to be in community, learning how to be in interdependence uh, is the way forward. I was in um, 
uh, a talk the other day where uh, there were some native elders on this panel and people were asking, what's the thing that we can do to be resilient through climate change? What's the like what? And they, the question was sort of rooted in policy. And um, the answer that was given was, well, it's to know your neighbors. It's to build neighborhood associations. It's so that when the power goes out, you know how to meet each other's needs. It's so when the hurricane hits, you know how to meet each other's needs. It's so that when food prices spike or skyrocket, you know how to meet each other's needs. And there's communities all throughout the US, whether that's New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, who have constantly experienced this. So part of what I think this work is, is demystifying the nature of apocalypse to not think of the situation we're in as entirely, it's not that unique in human history uh, in one way. Uh, and in another way, it's totally unique. That's another contradiction we have to hold. And I think what's what's really interesting to me about that, actually, and this brings up the, these other kind of contradictions that I'm trying to actually explore, because so on one hand, and a major part of the ethos of this show is we are in a global world by it, it, both by objective reality and by aspiration. We are internationalists and we're in. There's synchronized struggles. They're not the same. I, lo I love Zizek's distinction about you have the local and the particular, and then you find the universal through that versus imposing a universal. But of course, there's universal subjectivity. Of course, there's shared bounds of an experience. And there is literal political interdependency. I mean, ecology is the most obvious example, but across every area, all of these struggles matter and are connected, and that's also a beautiful fruition of, uh, of, of, of a socialist vision, frankly. Yeah. And, and then at the same time, there is a deep, deep yearning right now for community, for connection, and sense of finding oneself in space. And this is this Bruno Latour book that I've been referencing a lot, where he talks about coming back down to earth where literally like globalization is an imaginal project it's it's a fantasy life that is incompatible with like the literal ecological base upon which we all live and then the magical thinking about technology saving us from those limits gets more and more intense and not to say technology won't play a role but it's not going to save us like there isn't going to just be like oh, we figured out how to upload ourselves onto the cloud and now pollution doesn't matter. Like, it, that's not going to happen. And so what I'm trying to say, though, and then but then there's like that other tendency of like, OK, but then we of course we see this rise of nationalism and xenophobia and intense cruelty and discrimination and the resurgence of that. And so we object to that and fight against that correctly and in every regard. But then we cannot just throw away the fact that that might be a really uh, perverse and delusional, because it's also just a fantasy. Like all of these authoritarian projects are still globalizers and capital, extreme capital practitioners at the end of the day. But that human beings are seeking, like the healthy version of that is to actually know who your neighbor is and realize that you can't have a completely mediated life simply through technology. And then you would actually start to construct some type of dialectic between being a local, national, and global citizen. That, and that, I feel like that's what you're pointing to with this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, what's underneath what I think you're saying is that the left needs to have an answer to people's alienation and right. human beings yearn for connection and capitalism has robbed us of our connection to each other, of our relationship to land and doing, you know, wildfire focuses on really practical ways that organizations can uh, build into their culture, things like song, things like ritual, things like being uh, connected to the land that you're gathering on. And these things are not, you don't need to believe in any particular deity or God to participate in that kind of stuff. And that our basic proposition is that if, um, you know, if, if the left gives away that stuff to the right, mm -hmm. and in this moment when every, so many people are yearning for meaning, connection, belonging, interdependence, something to make sense of the fact that the entire, you know, here, here's another way of thinking about it. 
Uh, radicalization happens when you live an experience that's so different than how you've been taught to see the world mm. that it forces you to change your entire uh, operating story of how you understand the things around you just in order to make meaning of your life. And is the left offering people an answer to that? And, you know, I think there's a uh, generative agnosticism that the left can embrace, which is that. You know, and this is honestly what psychedelics teach people, and I'll come out of my closet as a as a practitioner, um, an advocate of psychedelic medicines. And oh my god, I had no idea. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and one of the things they teach us is like, no, none of us ha really have any idea of what's going on, <laughs> and um, and that I think what they've taught me is that um, what, some of the greatest leaps in the evolution of the human species happen when a particular social order bumps up against pressures that force us to give way into leaping into the unknown. And I believe that we're at one of those moments. Um, given the overlapping crises that we're in right now, uh, people are so, so hungry to be rooted in something. And the, the, whether it's eco-fascism or whether it's neoliberalism and the large you know, spectrum of political positions between those things, from the center to the right, there are a lot of answers to those. There's a lot of meaning making happening. And unless the left learns how to do that, we are not going to answer the yearning that the human species is calling for uh, when everything is constantly changing around us. And unless we can learn how to adapt and be humble, I think that's the other thing that um, these plant medicines that these spiritual physicians t teach us is to is to be humble. Yeah. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.